morning, I welcome all of you. I do want to share with you that I didn't know what we were going to sing this song, and I thought, you know what? We need to sing this song this morning. church here to get together for our annual conference um, for the Susquehanna Conference as we looked um, for our time of business to come together as one in the conference and just look at all of our quote laws um, and unquote those laws that are important that we continue to run as God's people in addition to that we had a time of prayer and the five of us um, had some time in the back in between the conference to just have lunch together and in all of that, I'm completely reminded that as we come together, even just our, in our own conference, it's important that we remember the rest of the world that comes together in different ways and fellowship and to look at their own laws to make sure that we are doing what is right by Jesus Christ. And this morning, um, I'd like to lift up a litany for our church and for the world as we celebrate in World Communion. Now, there will be a time when I will ask you to lift up your silent prayer. And in that, we will go from a, a moment of silence and just lift up your own prayer based upon whatever that litany is and just ask the Lord to listen to your heart in all of this. So let us go into a time of prayer, a prayer for our church and for our world. Permit, Almighty God, to all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By the people and our leaders of this community, this country and all of the nations, that we may do justice and example peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and convict that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. And bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Fill up the spirit of those affected by natural disaster and send your hands and feet to provide shelter and food. Send your hands and feet that they may see Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we offer these prayers. We offer these prayers of our heart. We offer these prayers for all of those around the world this day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9. 
and 12 through 20. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall able and do all your work. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on earth, beneath or in the waters below. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long on the land the Lord has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the, Lord, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled in fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sin. Today's Gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets, or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But, those who practice, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we welcome the Holy Spirit in this space today. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds that we may receive your word. Lord, let your word be like honey upon my lips, that I may share the old news, the present news, and the good news. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So as some, some of you know, last Sunday after church, my husband and I got into a car and we drove to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Now, one of the things that I was reminded of as we were driving, it was such a beautiful day and I couldn't wait to get to the one spot and there's this bridge that we cross over. And it's a pretty bridge. Um, once upon a time, it wasn't so pretty, but it's so pretty now. It's got these golden um, things across the cables and it's like you're driving through sunshine, like you're driving into something and leaving something behind. I love bridges. Bridges to me are a way to get from one side to the other. And when I get from one side to the other, I'm leaving the past behind and I'm going somewhere else. And this whole metaphor of bridges of looking in the past, looking in the present and looking forward, it kind of reminded me of what we're talking about today. I'm challenging all of you today to dust off your Old Testament. I want you to take it off the shelf and realize that our past is just as important as our present and our future. In order to get onto this bridge, there's things that we had to do, and that was learning how to drive. So who remembers the first time they got into a car to drive? I know I do, and I'm gonna share a little story here. I love my dad. My dad has taught me so much. He's not a cuddly person. He's not, he will never be accused of being warm and fuzzy. My dad is, is a man that's all about, this is the way you do it, this is the way it gets done. If you wanna know how to do something, you call my dad. If you wanna hug, you call my mom. So my dad had to teach me how to drive. And I'll never forget the second time I got into a car with my father. He said, come on Kelly, grab the keys, you're gonna to drive to piano lessons. 
And as we're driving, we get to a certain spot, and I don't know if I was supposed to turn, if I was supposed to stop, but whatever I did, my dad screamed, stop. And I'm gonna try to step away from the microphone because I have to do an impersonation of my father. Oh my gosh, Kelly, what are you doing? His voice went like 10 octaves above what he normally does. I stepped on the brake, and I'm pretty sure we skidded off to the side. At that moment, I swore I would never teach my son how to drive that way, nor my daughter, whatever I would have. I would never scream at my children when we drove. So fast forward to a time when I remembered those moments. And I'm riding with my son, my oldest son, and we're going on um, a particular road. And all of a sudden, on this little country road, we had to make a sharp turn. And here comes a tractor trailer. Now I know, for any of you that are local, you know Farmer Luffy. Farmer Luffy probably had this truck coming in to gather pumpkins so that he could take to sale. And at that moment, I love, 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 love Brian Campbell, but at that moment I started to curse Brian Campbell because as that truck came at us, my son froze and he didn't know what to do. And instead of just going slow, he decided that he would veer off the road and go into a ditch in my minivan. So I'm sitting here and I'm not going to scream, I'm not going to go 10 octaves higher, I'm just going, Tanner, 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 and I scream. And I realized that I had to tell him the laws of driving is, is that when something big comes at you, you need to slow down and proceed with caution. Not if you're off the side of the road so that we have to call your dad to come dig us out. But there are laws that we have to follow. There are laws that we have to do in the beginning of driving to learn how to get where to go. And if you remember all of those tests that you took in driving, there were laws of things that you shouldn't do and laws of things that you should do. And here in scripture this morning, we, we heard two different things here. We heard the absolute law. And God is talking to Moses, and he's talking, and there's all of this thunder and all of this lightning, and it is ominous. And the people are watching all around Moses as God is delivering all of the things that they should not do. So here's where I'm going to invite you to turn to Scripture. I want you to open up your Old Testament, blow up the dust, and I want you to open it up, and we're going to take a look at Exodus chapter 20. Now in chapter 20, God is speaking these words, and I love Lanny. I can't do a Lanny impersonation because my voice cannot go that low. But as he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God's reminding his people of his covenant that he made with them to bring them out of oppression. To bring them out of slavery into a new world. And these people are brand new of what to do in this new world. They have been taught their whole lives to follow all of these different gods, to follow different ways that would appease their, their oppressors, but it did nothing to enrich their lives. And right away, as he talks about that, he talks about how they shall have no other gods before me. These Israelites were so used to all of those old gods, and God is telling them that you cannot mix me with anyone else. I am the one and the only. And he tells them, you shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on earth, beneath or in the waters below, no idols. You're not to worship anything else. You're not to put anything else before me. Nothing else. And then he tells them to bow down and worship him. For I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, punishing the children of sin and the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, I want you to make this understood because I want to make you understand this particular portion. This isn't that God is cursing our children. It's just that when we sin by example, our children learn by that example. And unfortunately, or in the case of being a Christian, fortunately, there's consequences to sin. Because when we sin against one another, or when we sin against God, those particular consequences have to be carried out, and unfortunately, those sins will go on through generation to generation. I'll give you an example. If I were a drug user, this would be a sin against God. It would hurt my children. It would hurt them in a way that would make them broken, 
And then they would take whatever example they learned from me and pass it on to the next generation and so on. So it's not that God is cursing them. He's just making them realize that your sin is a great consequence and it will be passed on through generations if you do not make this change. He goes on to tell them all of the other commandments. And Lanny didn't read those particular ones in our scripture today, but he does talk about the misuse of the name of the Lord that we cannot use the Lord to swear against anyone. We cannot um, say that, well, um, Jesus Christ told me to blow up an abortion clinic. No, you can't do that. That's not what Jesus Christ told us to do. And to remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He talks about all of these other particular things about not murdering, about not stealing, about not committing adultery. He talks about not coveting or lying and bearing false witness. He also talks about honoring our mother and our father. And this is really important because in this time when these Israelites were leaving Egypt, they were starting a brand new way in the Lord to learn how not to do these things. And they had to pass on all of these laws to the next generation. And he wanted all of these children to look to their mother and father, to look through the original creation of mom and dad and child and make sure that you pass on these laws. In, in order to pass on those laws, you had to honor your mother and father because they were teaching you these particular laws. This was important of the law of that time. And in that moment, as these 10 commandments were delivered to all of these people, like I told you earlier, there's all of this thunder, all of this lightning, and these people are so afraid and they freeze and they are scared. They want to run away from God because they don't understand the power and the might and the glory of what is going on here. They want to run in fear. And it's in that moment that Moses tells them to not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The fear of God is so mighty and so great that instead of being afraid and being frozen, we should be unfrozen and be afraid to be apart from God. And this is where Jesus comes in today with our gospel. You see, in the gospel, Jesus is very clear, and I want you to flip ahead if you've got your Bible. I want you to go to chapter 5 of Matthew, and I want you to look at verses 17 through 20. Jesus is very clear as he's talking to the people, and I'm not talking to just the people that want to the marginalized or um, the sinners or whatever. He's also talking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are shaking in their shoes right now because he is the answer. He's the one who came. And they're a little bit nervous here as to what's going on. And Jesus says, not just to all of those people, but he says it to the Pharisees. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus bridges to the past of the laws that were given to Moses. All of that time, those people were brand new and coming to be God's people, having to relearn everything, and all of these laws had to be written in black and white. People needed to know what not to do so that they could proceed. But now, as Jesus comes and he fulfills the law, he looks back to these laws and he says, I'm telling you, those laws are important, and you know what you're not to do, but here's what you need to know what to do. You need to know how to live a righteous life. And I want you to say a word with me. The word is sanctify. Say it with me. Sanctify. This word sanctification is such an amazing word because as we live in grace to Jesus Christ, we come before him, confess our sins, lay our lives down, we turn away to walk in righteousness. A new beginning is there for us. We are alive in a new way that we were not alive before. Just like the Israelites were back then, we are the same today. Jesus Christ came for all people, not just the chosen people of the Israelites, but we were grafted into that. So we need to understand the sin in its infancy so that we do not do those things. But Jesus Christ tells us what to do in all of that. He goes on in his Sermon in the Mount that you have heard that you are not to kill. But I tell you, don't even think about it. Don't even go there because as soon as you do, you start to get angry. And as soon as you start to get angry, it leads you into a point of murderous thoughts inside of you. 
It doesn't matter whether or not you go through and you kill somebody. The point is, is that you've already entered into sin by allowing the stuff to come inside of you. He talks about adultery, and it's the same thing. He cautions us that even if we even get with a relationship with another person other than the person that we are married to, we are already entering a point of adultery. We are starting to have those thoughts about another person that leads us into the temptation of sin. Jesus Christ is telling us, no, walk away and live a life of righteousness. Be brand new. Come and follow me, and this is how you do it. And he laid that pathway out for all of the people. He led them away from sin, not in a way to be afraid of God and fear like the thunder and lightning like the Israelites were, but he led them in a way of fear to be afraid to be apart from God. You see, we make our own choosing. Each one of us chooses whether or not we sin. Each one of us chooses whether or not we choose Jesus Christ to be our Savior. We choose whether or not we are going to hell or to heaven in the way that we live our lives today. Do you hear me? I hear so many people ask me, well, if your God was a loving God, then why does he send nice people to hell? I can't tell you how many times I hear that challenge to my father. And my response is, is that you choose whether or not you want to go to hell. Being nice is not good enough. You need to choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to live with God instead of apart from God. Look at it this way. If God were to send you an invitation and you said, I don't want to come, and then the time comes when you see everybody in that party having a good old time, and you're like, hey, well, I changed my mind, I want to come. God's saying it's too late. I sent you invitation after invitation, and you refused me. That's what the whole thing is of Jesus Christ telling them, you cannot live apart from my Father. He says in verse, in verse 19, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others, hear that one, teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. I preach on this so much. Many of, our, many of my colleagues, we have like five good sermons in our pocket, and we tend to focus on those things. And I'm a Pentecostal type of pastor. I love Pentecost. I love a new beginning. The whole thing about what he's saying in verse 19 is that whoever teaches these commands will be called the least if they don't follow all of them. And this is where we turn Jesus Christ into a one-note person, that we turn Jesus Christ into hippie Jesus. We turn Jesus Christ into a person who's just like us. Let me tell you right now, Jesus Christ is not just like us. We are born in God's image, but we are apart from Jesus Christ because we have a sinful nature. Jesus Christ did not have a sinful nature because he was of God. Jesus Christ was so great that he wanted to teach us that these laws were golden. It's not just about loving our neighbor. It's about changing our lives. When we take communion today, communion is about your personal salvation. It's not about the salvation about the ones that are around you and whether or not you loved them and you permitted everything that they did. It's about how you loved them and not giving them permission of what they did, but leading them and teaching them in the way of the Lord. Your personal salvation is the change that you make with God, and when you make that change with God, you model and you do those things with God. And that's what Jesus is teaching them in all of that, that these laws were good. But when he came, he made them even better, because now we learn how to live a life and be sanctified. And that's where grace comes into all of this. Back then, when the laws were laid down with Moses and all of his people, there were certain things that they had to do to atone for their sinful ways. When Jesus Christ came, there was a way in which we can atone through Jesus Christ to lay everything down at the cross, to ask for forgiveness. And this is the most important that asking for forgiveness we had to repent and walk in the way of the Lord. And what that meant was we had to leave our sinful life behind us. Now, our sinful nature will have us want to fall back into sin. But each time we can come back to the Lord and live 
with Jesus Christ, walk in the way of Jesus Christ, and live a life brand new. The more we live a life of discipline by not doing the old things that leaves us in our comfortable, sinful nature, the better we are, the closer we are in our walk with Jesus Christ. But for many of us, we get frozen. We get frozen on by what we're not supposed to do, that we tend to stay in that moment and live in that sinful nature. My son, my second son, when he was little, he was just, oh my goodness, he had a personality that was so tenacious and challenged me. And the older he gets, the more I see myself in him, which is kind of scary, but he's very strong-willed. And he always wanted to do things, things his way. And of course, his mom, I had to tell him, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. And he would get to the point where he would threaten to run away. So there came that day when he packed his clothes, which was one t-shirt, and he no pants, which I thought was kind of funny, but he packed a t-shirt, and he put it in his little knapsack, and he started to walk out the door. He was going to run away because he was sick and tired of me telling him not what to do. And as he's walking, he's looking over his shoulder. It's so cute. I have to do one of these. He's going like this, and he take a step or two, and he looked behind him. Take a step or two and look behind him. And my daughters are crying, no, Spencer, don't run away, don't run away. And I'm just sitting there laughing because I know he's not going to get far. As he gets to a certain point, he looks back and he yells at me, hey, I'm just a kid. Don't you know I can't walk on the road? Aren't you going to call me back? He was frozen in that moment. He was frozen on the road because he knew, even though I had told him all of the things he shouldn't do, it was a brand new world and it was scary because he knew he couldn't walk on the road. Now that he's older, he knows how to walk on the road. Now that he's older, he knows what those dangers are in the world and he knows what to do. All of those laws that I gave him as a little boy was a start, was a start for him to start all over. But now that he has grown, and he's grown into a young man. He knows that the righteous things to do so that he cannot get in trouble. Now, I can tell you he's only 18 years old, and I can tell you he's going to have a lot of false starts, and I can tell you that he's going to make mistakes. We are just like an 18-year-old boy or an 18-year-old girl. We will have those false starts, and we'll have those mistakes that we make, but through Jesus Christ, we can start over again and we don't have to be frozen we don't have to be scared just like the israelites were but we need to go back in our infancy and start all over the bridges that we build to move forward to go to the other side are bridges that are important that we need to understand where we came from we need to look in our rearview mirror and sometimes we need to go back across that bridge and revisit everything we need to learn how to drive again we need to learn that we can't just keep going in the middle of the bridge hoping that if we play chicken, the other car will fall off. We can't keep hoping that if we drive really fast, something good will happen. We need to learn how to drive all over again and learn those laws all over again. Once we learn those laws all over again, we need to know what to do and to drive correctly to cross that bridge into the future. Once we cross that bridge into the future, we need to come together and bridge all of that together. You see, we and all of us were grafted into the original family of God. The Israelites were the chosen of that time. But when Jesus Christ came, he spoke to all of the people that day. He spoke to all of the people to this day. And this day we have brothers and sisters all around the world that have heard the stories of the Old Testament that were true that were good, and that were righteous. We have brothers and sisters all around the world that heard the good news of Jesus Christ, the news that said, you can come and lay all of your burdens down, you can lay your sin down at the cross, come in communion with me, Jesus Christ, and start life anew. We have an opportunity today to come in our own personal salvation and communion and know that we are not alone in the family of God. And we also have the challenge that we have to get that information out to other people so that they know that there weren't a multitude of gods, that, oh, there's truth in Buddhism, there's truth in all of these other religions. But we need to, as Christians, tell the truth of a God 
that's so great. And do it in a way that's in a way of love, the love that Jesus Christ taught to all of the people, to let them know that they are grafted and invited into our family. We need to love people that are different than us in a way that says, even though I don't believe in what you believe in, here's what I believe in, and let me tell you why I believe, why I live, why I love, and why I walk righteously in the way of Jesus Christ. This challenge to you today, as you come and lay your personal salvation, is a challenge to build the church around the world, the church of Jesus Christ, that says that we are sanctified and we are holy. But the only way to do it is to take the roadmap of the past and stop doing what we're not supposed to do and start doing the things that Jesus Christ modeled for us to do. My invitation for you today is to come before the Lord and say, God, I am ready. This time, I am ready to lay all of my sin down before you. I am ready to repent. I am ready to start over, and I am ready to walk in your way. And not only am I ready to walk in your way, but I'm willing to look across the table, the table that you set before me, and see my other brothers and sisters and to help them to walk in your way. And then to walk away from the table, I'm ready to have others walk with me. We're building bridges to our past, we're building bridges to our future, and we're building bridges out into a world that needs to know that this is good. It is real good. It is holy, it is sanctified, and it is of God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. This morning, I invite you all to the table. Christ our Lord invites you to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another and the world. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Almighty and powerful, loving Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have reconciled the world to yourself. Convict us to be reconciled with one another, that we may dwell in unity with your welcome, love, and embrace. We confess that we are chained and held to our unbelief, frustration, pride, and suffering. Inspire our trust to move forward in faith to your purpose. All that we may join with your people to declare your gospel. At this time, take a couple moments to lift up your personal sin to the Lord and ask forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God and glory to God. In this moment, I would like you to offer to one another a sign of peace as reconciled people. If you're watching at home, please make a comment below to offer peace. And as we do here in the building, we offer peace like this. church. Yesterday as we sat in here, we were reminded of all of the things in which we give our money to every week. We give through something that's called Shares of Ministry. And there was one portion where some people had some questions and the church, as we 
have to cut some benefits for our retired pastors. And we talked about this amongst ourselves. In your church of ministry, you're taking care of people in our conference with their retirement. You're taking care of people that have served, oh my goodness, 10 years, 20 years. We had one gentleman who retired from a position in which he served for 50 years. I had the great honor of being under a person who served 70 years as a pastor. I can't even imagine that. But these people in our conference are people to be lauded as one of God's saints. So this morning, I ask you, in your time, to give in the spirit of all of these people who serve God's people, that spread the good news, that spread the love, who cared for people on their deathbeds, who cared for people as they were just beginning a new life in marriage, who cared for the infants that were brought before them and baptized in the church. So in your time this morning, I ask you to offer them spirit. In your offering as one of God's people, I ask you to look to the Lord and see where God is guiding you in ministry. Is God asking you to be a Bible teacher? Is God asking you to be one who prays for others, who holds their hand at the beginning, the end, or even in the middle? How is God calling you this morning? Is he calling you with gifts that you think are untapped in the church? Give your gift to God wherever he is calling you this morning. Just take a few moments to ask God, where did I do? Dear Heavenly Father, we give to you with great thanks and great offering of who we are through you, Lord. You have granted us so many gifts, and we humbly lay before you even this tiny portion. But Lord, it's not just our tithe, but it's the offering of ourselves. So God, this morning I ask you to receive these gifts. You are the author of every good gift in our life. Out of the bounty of our hearts, we respond with thankful generosity and love. Lord, may these gifts become blessings for others as they have been a blessing for us. Amen. Amen. This morning, let us join together in our thanksgiving and communion. The Lord be with you. And also we lift up our hearts and give thanks to the Lord. Blessed are you, O God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, you have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples for all the nations. And today his family and all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night of his betrayal, our Lord Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. As he blessed the bread, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, this is my body which was given to you. Every time you take this, do this. In remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He took the cup and he said to them, This is my blood, the new covenant. This is my blood which was poured out to you and for the many of all the many for forgiveness of all of your sins. As often as you take this, do this in remembrance of me. In the remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves a praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we, as we proclaim the mystery of Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here in the presence 
of you, O Lord. Pour out your spirit on each one of these gifts, the gifts in which we have at our table, the gifts in which we have in our pews, the gifts in which we have in our tables from afar. Pour out your Holy Spirit. May these gifts that connect the body and blood of Christ that we may be the world, the body of Christ. Renew our communion with your church and through the world and strengthen it, strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. As God's people, let us speak the words that Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, we come together as God's people all around the world. We come fractured in our own way as we come together across the internet, as we come together in our sanctuary separated from one another. But there is one body, there's one foundation, the only solid truth. Today, there cannot be one loaf. As there are many in the body separated by the location, our shepherd and our protector who keeps us safe, separates us so that we can be safe in our own place. Our individual loaves is like that with the wheat of the creator. And that, in its true nature, combines us to one another. So today we share through that spirit in the body of Christ, given and broken in love. I invite you now to just take a piece of your bread wherever you are. If you're couple to couple, I invite you to take the bread in that moment. And if you're all alone, I ask you to take the bread in one hand. And as communion, we never take communion, but we receive it. So just take that and put that in the hand and receive the body of Christ. Eat and remember the body broken for you. take your cup wherever you may be take it and receive it from Jesus Christ take and drink and remember the covenant the blood that was shed for you take and drink personal communion. Take a moment to remember all of the things that Jesus Christ did for you that day. Bringing from the past, bringing to the future. Heavenly Father, you have set your servants free to go in peace as you have promised. We put our trust and faith in our baptism with the Holy Spirit. You have renewed our hope and our new life through the cross. For these eyes of ours have seen the Savior, whom we have prepared for all of the world to see. Our hearts reveal the love of you by our love for them. Blessing and honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
every year since I've come here. This is my third year at Trinity. And there's a song that I love to sing. Um, I know it's a simple song. It's a song that we sang as little kids. I don't have any accompaniment, so we're going to sing it. And I'm going to grab, because I have some words here. And I'll come back over to the camera. Um, we are going to sing, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. So this is an actual, actually an easy song, and you probably sang it as a little kid. So I invite you to sing the song with me. Sorry, you ready? He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got Africa and Asia in his hands. He's got all the Americas in his hands. He's got all the Europeans in his hands. He's got the whole world. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got all the little children, in his hands. He's got the whole world 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 in his hands. The Lord has you in his hands, and he invites you every day, and he wants you to know where you came from, he wants you to know where you're going, and he wants you to know where you will end up. So with your brothers and sisters today, just say a prayer for all of us, knowing that we are all of God's people grafted into the world, into the world of God. Go in peace, go in love, and go as a new person, holy and sanctified. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And although God's people said,